Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DI 101 webinar series. My name is Jared Evans, and I'm the Director of Marketing for Distribution International. If you are new to the DI 101 webinar series, I can tell you that it is an incredible resource offered to DI customers, partners, and associates. By partnering with our manufacturers and our industry experts, these webinars deliver informative presentations about industry trends, new technology, new products, and product applications. In order to fully support our customers, Distribution International offers products and solutions from multiple manufacturers and brands in many product categories. This webinar does not represent an endorsement of one manufacturer or brand over another. We pride ourselves in partnering with manufacturers that deliver products of the highest quality to our customers. We are extremely excited to welcome our strategic manufacturing partner, Knopf Insulation, for today's webinar presentation. Today's course details the basics of condensation formation, avoiding condensation formation and intrusion, and key points of application for successful use of fiberglass pipe and equipment ins insulation on chilled water cooling systems. The information presented applies to both commercial and industrial facilities and systems for space cooling, process cooling, or product cooling. Let's take a second to introduce our presenters from Knopf. We have Frank Bridges. He is the manager of training and certifications for Knopf Insulation North America. He has more than 40 years of active involvement with the thermal insulation industry. We have Daryl Peel, uh, business development manager with uh, Knopf Insulation North America. Daryl is currently a member of the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers and the American Society for Testing Materials. He serves on several committees related to mechanical insulation systems and components. And he's also the current chair of National Insulation Association's Technical Information Committee. We also have Michael Stoner. He is the manager of strategic accounts. Michael holds the construction documents technologist des designation from the Construction Specifications Institute and the lead green associate designation from the U.S. Green Building Council. He's been in the building materials industry for more than 20 years. We're very proud to have these folks from Knopf present today and we thank them for their time. We will field questions at the end of the webinar. To submit questions, please use the questions tab on the GoToWebinar control panel. You can submit your questions at any point during the webinar and we will answer the questions at the end. Without further delay, I will turn this over to Michael Stoner with Knopf Insulation. Hey, thank you, Jared. I, uh, I really appreciate that introduction and the opportunity to present here today. Uh, as you stated, I'm Michael Stoner. I'm the Strategic Accounts Manager for the CNI Division of Knopf Insulation. I want to thank Distribution International for putting this event together and for all the effort to consistently provide educational programming that allows those in our industry to participate, learn, and get better at what we do. We look forward to sharing information, having a good interaction today, as we review fiberglass insulation for cooled water, chilled water cooling systems. So welcome to all the attendees. We appreciate everyone taking time out of your busy schedules to join us and participate in this meeting. Along the way, if you do have questions, as Jared said, please enter them in the chat box. Uh, as we go through our presentation, we'll do our best to answer them accordingly. The following slide is a short summary of today's presentation content. This includes product knowledge as it relates to mechanical systems, details for effective use of fiberglass insulation with chilled water, and a brief overview of Knopf insulation. I already mentioned today's presenters, Frank Bridges, Mr. Daryl Peel, and myself. We'll start out with the presumption that some people on this call have familiarity with Knopf insulation. This slide provides a quick snapshot of our global presence. Knopf Insulation North America is part of the Knopf Group. Over the past 85 years, they have consistently expanded to provide innovative building solutions worldwide. While this presentation will focus primarily on our commercial portfolio, we do offer a full range of fiberglass insulation products. This includes residential and light commercial, commercial and industrial, and OEM products. Which brings us to our topic for today, fiberglass insulation for chilled water cooling systems. Frank Bridges will take it from here 
and begin discussion on pipe and duct insulation applications. So please take it away, Frank. Well, thank you, sir. I hope everyone's having a good day. Um, I'm excited to be here. Look forward to this. Hopefully you'll uh, pick up something that you can use. And let's just jump right on in. If I were to ask you to define temperature, what would you tell me? It's not an easy thing to define, but here's one that you can use as far as definitions go. I'll pause for a minute and let you read that rather than me read it. Very simply, it's heat energy content. That's what temperature is. How much energy is in an object or a body? Also, what if I ask you about ambient temperature? What is that? The, 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 the air, the, the sense of temperature that you feel in the room you're in right now, that's your ambient. All right, let's set that aside. Why are we talking about this stuff? Well, we got, we got some fundamentals that we need to uh, we need to have stuck in our pocket, pull out when we need them. But before we get into that, a major application in mechanical systems is chill water or less than ambient. It's a, a very difficult um, arena to operate in. If the, if the contractor doesn't do what he want or what he should do, we're going to know about it. There's going to be a failure. If it's the wrong material, there's going to be a failure. Um, if there's damage to the insulation, there's going to be a failure. That applies to our product. It applies to all products. Um, but having said that, if it's taken care of, properly installed, and a good thickness, an appropriate thickness, you've got something there with fiberglass that will work, work beautifully. The major contributions fiberglass will give you, Knauf Insulations glass, is uh, right there on those bullets. Those are two important bullets. Reduction of heat gain. You don't want heat, the ambient air temperature. You don't want that going migrating into the pipe. It's um, or the duct. That's operating, uh, causing the uh, efficiency issue, and increasing cost. Prevent water vapor condensation. That's the bigger one, frankly, the most uh, recognizable, most often complained about. We've got water, it's raining in here. You know, that's what it is. Now, where does that come from? We're going there. Please understand these. This is not, uh, this is not thermodynamics, but it is probably a, a look into thermodynamics. Water molecules are in motion always, even in solid ice. As they are exposed to heat, they start moving more. They get to be more active and they will break bond and they'll fly away. They're out in the atmosphere now uh, looking for a place to go. First law of physics. The universe is supposed to be, everything in it is supposed to be cold, but there's this thing called the sun. There's this thing called fossil fuel. <laughs> That, that we all use to heat things up. Physics doesn't like that. The universe doesn't like that. But keep that in mind. Cold is a natural state. Everything wants to be cold. Objects, any object with differing temperatures or what's known in our industry, the delta T, will attempt to equalize. But the flow will only occur one way. Only one way from hot to cold to hot it just um, simply um, gotta, it's got to be that way remember the law of physics and as we touched on earlier where heat energy levels rise the more active and um, um, desperate i'll call it those uh, molecules want to get to that cold surface 
that's not only in the industry, it's vapor drive. So let's, let's see if we can throw some of this all together here. Let's imagine we're in an equipment room. More than likely, it's got um, it's vented to the outside. You know, it's it's going to be essentially ambient air temperature for the most part. Not always, but for the most part. And here we've got a 14 inch shore water pipe, and we've got a 24 by 18 galvanized sheet metal duct. Wonderful. Everything's laying flat. We're we're plan view. We're looking down on it. We got 90 degree ambient. It's hot, like it is today. What does that mean? Well, everything in that room is going to be at ambient temperature because there's there's no flow occurring in our pipe. There's no air blowing through our duct. Systems aren't running. So Mr. Molecule, he's flying around. He's looking for a place to go. He don't find anything attractive. Nothing going on. None to minimal vapor drive. Let's change things up a little bit. <clears throat> We've got 80% relative. With those two known points, 90 Fahrenheit and 80% relative, easily you can you can calculate or go to a psychometric chart and pick off a dew point. There it is. At 83 degrees Fahrenheit, things will sweat. Vapor condensation will occur. We're not going to have any sweat right now because everything's 90 degrees. Let's synergize our pipe. We got 42 degree uh, water going through it. It's going to give me a surface temperature with the ambient of 42.1. Everybody see that? I got 90 less 42.1. Now I've got a delta T over here that's uh, really pretty aggressive. It's going to split. Here's our air duct. It's a 55 degree air inside that duct. But as I said before, with ambient having an effect on the uh, the duct, that's the surface is going to be 61.4 degrees still. A relatively strong delta T and a vapor drive. Those molecules, where'd they go? Right to the coldest surface they could find. Let's put in a one mile an hour wind just for fun because you really can't find an environment uh, on a job site. I don't, I don't think you can where there's zero wind speed. Um, but let's work with a one mile an hour wind. Oh, we got a problem. That's totally predictable. Everybody in the room knew that that was going to happen. All right, so what do we do? How do we get around that? The answer is insulation. Now, you're going to hate me for doing this, but stay with me. Let's imagine that that's bare, unjacketed insulation. Everybody in the room knows that we're not going to do that. But I want to show you something. Take a look at the uh, performance of that bare insulation. In both cases, it's above the dew point. Theoretically, it will not sweat. But remember our friend, Mr. Molecule. Can he get in there? Go right through that insulation, just like it's not there. That's an uncomfortable truth. You got to seal it. You got to put a vapor barrier on it. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but those guys are flying right through the insulation mass. And here's where you're gonna hate me. It doesn't matter what insulation. Yeah, I know there are closed cell phones out there. I know they are, but there's also laboratory test data that tells us, yep, it'll, it'll go right through that as well. Not liquid, but vapor. Hang with me. Part two of that equation. Here's the insulation to raise it above the uh, surface or the uh, dew point. Here's the second part. I'll give you a moment to look through that. You have to put a vapor barrier on it. And when you do, you, you lock out the moisture. Everything stays stable. Here's some insulation. Under example number one, we're looking at a four-inch four 
pound and a half death trap. That's a lot. That is a lot. But you have to have that in, a, in an extreme 90-80 relative um, environment. It re is required. Ours, anybody else's. So we're looking at 84.1. How about one pound duck crap? Now we're at four and a half inches. We're just barely above. I'm saying none of these are comfortable. I'm not comfortable with either one at the um, design conditions we're listing up here. Let's try to let's try fiberglass boards with an ASJ jacket. Yeah, well, better, better. Even though it's one inch. Even though, now let's clear up something right here. Knopf insulation is not telling you that one inch is sufficient in that application. We're not. All it would take would be a slight change in the humidity. And guess what? We got rain again. It's going to sweat. Don't design to, to uh, minimums. But it's good information. Let's go one more. Six pound, one inch thick, ASJ. You see the emittance on all these products as we go. Pay attention to those because these numbers are going to be affected dramatically by that. One inch, six pound. It'll work. It will work. Three inch, three pound, FSK. Everybody knows what that is, hopefully. False grim crap. And also a jacket on the ASJ. Dramatically different emissivity between FSK and ASJ. Those aren't just terms. Those aren't just numbers. Those are big, big issues. We're going to see why. Here's another one. FSK. Point one. Three inch six pound. Works great. But it's right on the cusp of not being a performer as far as surface temperature. What's that? Well, at least what I found interesting, look at example one and two. Most of those have a 0.1 emittance, as does five and six. Or excuse me. Yeah, I guess five and five. It's five and six. Excuse me. Pardon me. But at a 0.1 emitter, what's happening? You need more thickness but look at the heat gain numbers compared to the 0.81 emitters. We got a highly affected system here. So, so you know, here's, here's where the engineers got to stop and think, now, wait a minute. Yeah, the three inch would cost me more, or the four, or the four and a half. It would cost me more than a two and a half, or, you know, yeah, or one inch. But, but, what am I getting in performance? Because his performance over here is not as good. It's, it's thickness driven. Now, here's a commitment to anybody in the room that might have an interest later. If you want to get really deep into this, I'm ready. And you'll have an opportunity later to contact us. We want to come see you. Let's keep going. What about our pipe? Same identical um, um, design conditions. Got to have that vapor barrier. There's an all-service jacket that Knauf produces on our um, Earthwell 1000. It'll work at one inch. Don't ever specify one inch. If a guy tells you, I want some one inch for my uh, chill water, tell him, I'll sell it to you, but you're going to have a problem. It will happen. Not under these conditions, but on some conditions. How about one inch, 14 inch by one vapor barrier with an ASJ with aluminum jacketing? What happened? Radical, radical surface temperature change. We went from 84.1 equal thickness to 79. That's going to sweat all day long. Aluminum jacket. 
<laughs> it's not your friend that you order. Okay, we'll look at some more thicknesses later. 14 by two, how will that work with an aluminum jacket? It's better, but I'm telling you, that is just barely, 83.8, barely. Uh, it's not acceptable, it's just barely functional. Well, okay. What if we go two and a half? I can live with that. Sure can. I'm about 14 by three. Yeah, I can certainly live with that. 88.2, look at these numbers right here. I got a high emitter. You see the, the, the uh, 0.9 emitters. That's giving me some tremendous, tremendous performance. Why is that? Because a high emitter is not allowing the heat in the environment to get to the pipe. Nor is it allowing <laughs> our, our radical little molecule to get in. So just to wrap this up real quick, you got to have a vapor barrier. It got to be properly installed. Has to be functional. All right, I'm done. And um, I know somebody's got questions. Put them in the question box. We'll address them. And I'm going to turn this thing back over to Mr. Daryl Peel. Thank you, Fred. A very informative foundation for condensation formation and controlling condensation. Next, we'll introduce and discuss the most common details of a chilled water insulation system that needs extra focus to make a sound installation. As Frank just remembered, reminded everybody, uh, please enter the questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Okay, so moving along here. Uh, high priority focus areas when insulating chilled water systems. There are a few details of a correct chilled water installation done with fiberglass that are significant. These six points of a fiberglass insulation system are those key points of special attention to detail and cause the most need for rework or repair, both prior, system, prior to system startup or after the system is started and commissioned. All these areas of the installation should get extra focus from the installing mechanics. The overlaps on the vapor retarder, butt joint sealing, uh, fitting sealing, vapor sealing details, insulating through the pipe supports, and the jacket enclosure all offer opportunity for extra oversight for detail. Now we'll dig a little deeper into the subject of the vapor control details. Vapor sealing is key and often is not completely understood for cold work. In a below ambient temperature or cold work situation, all else can be installed exactly correctly on a chilled water insulation system, but a complete and uncompromised vapor retarder or vapor barrier is critical to the proper function of the insulation system. We'll review some key information here. To reinforce earlier information, a vapor retarder or vapor barrier must be fully sealed and undamaged to provide resistance to the entry of water vapor that can condense into water somewhere in the insulation envelope. Remember Frank's little blue drips coming off of both the ductwork and the pipe. Uh, that's, that's, that's a case of what we're talking about. The two major types of vapor retarders used with fiberglass and chilled water installations are ASJ or all service jacket as described in this slide. ASJ is a laminate that is composed of foil, reinforcing scrim and bleach craft. The measure of a vapor retarder's ability to resist water vapor is the perm rating. ASJ has a perm rating of zero two perms. The newer, more advanced construction and higher performance of vapor retarder jacketing can offs ASJ plus in, that incorporates a polypropylene film exterior has been introduced and is becoming the industry standard. This newer vapor retarder offers a perm rating of 01 perms and doubles the water vapor resistance of the jacket over standard ASJ. Matching tapes help to complete sealing of seams that are offered for both types of vapor retarders, the premium ASJ Plus and the standard ASJ. 
Vapor retarder mastics exist to help complete the vapor retarding system of a chilled water insulation job. There are several selections of mastics that provide differing functions in the insulation world. It is very important to confirm that the mastic being used is a vapor retarder mastic since many are not. It's important to note that the terms vapor retarder and vapor barrier are not interchangeable terms. Quite often people do use them interchangeably. The definitions of each are shown here for the purposes of our conversation today, as Frank pointed out earlier, vapor retarding materials need to provide a perm rating of 0 0.02 or lower. There are materials out there that are considered vapor retarders that have perm ratings higher than 0 0.02, but they're not appropriate for the typical mechanical insulation system. And almost all industry guides refer to vapor retarders as 0 0.02 or less for our purposes. An installation detail gaining in attention in recent years is the use of vapor dams or vapor seals. The intent of this feature of an installation is to stop the migration of water through the insulation envelope should the vapor retarder fail and allow water vapor into the system. The intent is to isolate any problem to a specific section of the installation instead of allowing the problem to spread throughout the system. Fitting insulation needs to be completely vapor sealed across the entire fitting. PVC fittings need to be completely vapor sealed around circumferential overlaps and through the throat seam. Okay, we'll move on to more on jacket closures on the next screen. Again, to reinforce the point, installing the vapor retarder completely is highly important. Complete sealing and complete coverage with vapor dams included. The point that water vapor is constantly trying to find a path to the cold surface Water vapor finds all kinds of paths to cold surfaces. Shown are some of the most common paths to be diligent about. Fish mouths in the lap closure of the vapor retarder jacket or in the tape butt seams. Skips or holidays in thin spots and mastic applications. Tears or punctures of the vapor retarding materials and incomplete vapor retarding material installations. Uh, I think that between Frank and myself, we've probably seen all these kinds of um, oh, features, functions, failures of installation, whatever we want to call them, cause significantly failed chilled water uh, installations. And there is a lot of detail maintenance or attention to detail, I should say, uh, involved in doing this. And that's that's kind of a strong, strong point we want to reinforce here. And then finally, when installing the insulation system, care needs to be used not to puncture the vapor retarder. Screw staples and rivets are the enemy of a vapor retarder. A common installation error is the installation of a protective finish jacket that uses a securement method that punctures the underlying system. This kind of installation will require repair to the vapor retarder and reinstallation of the finish jacket using a securement practice that does not compromise the system. I've seen specs specifically where the engineer called out four screws or pop rivets to be used, staples to be used in the vapor retarding jacket. Uh, all those practices should be pointed out to the specifier uh, as something that will have a strong chance of creating failure so strong that you would prefer to see a different method of closure and securement employed. All this said, there are key uh, industry resources shown to you that are available in the next slide. The subject of proper installation of chilled water systems is a big topic for the mechanical systems industry. Shown here are the most commonly available resources to offer guidance on proper design and installation practices that will provide a fiberglass insulation system on chilled water that can provide the desired performance for the long term. Again, that performance being stopping condensation from forming and creating an energy efficient installation that is cost effective to operate. This is not an exhaustive list of resources since the topic is so important to our industry, but offers a great set of reference materials for the topic. All are authoritative sources and thoroughly address the topics that are associated with the subject. 
most recently an extensive review of vapor retarder technology and installation practices has been included in the 2021 ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals. Uh, for those not familiar, the Midwest Insulation Contract Association has published the National Commercial Industrial Insulation Standards Manual since 1978. Uh, 10th no, I'm sorry, ninth edition is just about ready to be released as one of the editorial members of the manual. Uh, we finished it up and it's off to the printers and should be available in about the next 30 days for anybody who's interested uh, in obtaining the most latest and greatest version. Uh, the North American Insulation published the guide to insulating chilled water piping systems, uh, oh, probably four, five, six years ago at least a very comprehensive guide to doing the kinds of work and detail attention that I just discussed. Uh, the ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals has been talking chilled water for quite some time, at least since I've been in the industry for many, many years. Uh, the 2021 version is being released and does have a significant amount of detail regarding vapor retarders and the importance of vapor retarders. And finally, the ASTM International has a standard guide for industrial thermal insulation. And that leads me to my next topic. The subject of fiberglass for chilled water applies to the industrial environment too, sometimes in a slightly different application as is shown next. When thinking of chilled water systems, the most commonly thought of application is for building space HVAC cooling. In fact, there's a large segment of the chiller industry that is focused on use of chilled water in the industrial environment for process control and product cooling. The kinds of industries and the kinds of systems for those industrial applications that may be insulated are shown here. As is shown, there's a wide range of industries that can use fiberglass to insulate their process and product cooling systems. Fiberglass has been widely and successfully used in these facilities for years and can be so in the future as well. Let's touch on some special considerations by the industrial user in the next screen. Okay, in keeping with the use of fiberglass in the industrial environment, several key design desires or requirements enter the selection process for materials. Shown on the left are some of the more common selection criteria used by the industrial owners and managers. Shown on the right is the detailing of how fiberglass insulation materials have been demonstrated to meet the selection criteria, making fiberglass highly suitable and effective for the industrial environment, as well as the commercial environment for chilled water cooling. Knopf offers fiberglass insulation materials that can be used to complete a sound insulation system installation on all the kinds of systems and applications for chilled water, be it commercial HVAC cooling, or industrial process and product cooling. Materials are available for pipe, duct, and equipment that will allow for the proper installation and finishing, delivering highly suitable performance and appearance. That concludes this section of today's presentation. Back to Michael for a bit of a deeper dive into information related to Knopf. Hey, thank you, Daryl. That was uh, some good detail. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of content, a lot of uh, specifics, but uh, all good stuff. Um, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that some of you might be familiar with Knopf insulation, but uh, we did want to provide a, a little bit more detail on the company history and some of the innovation that's taken place over the years. Um, Knopf insulation as part of the Knopf Group was established over 40 years ago. It is headquartered in Shelbyville, Indiana, about 45 minutes southeast of Indianapolis. The company is 100% Family owned and independent. As you can see in the blue shaded area on the right of this slide, Knopf was established in 1978 as Knopf Fiberglass through the purchase of an existing fiberglass production facility in Shelbyville. Later on, the company expanded operations, renovated manufacturing facilities, and eventually became Knopf Insulation. A couple important milestones on this page I want to highlight. One is Knopf Fiberglass becoming the first insulation company to earn Green Guard certification in 2002. I also want to point out the introduction of Ecos technology in 2008. This is our sustainable binder chemistry, 
that replaces the phenol formaldehyde binder traditionally used in fiberglass products. Lastly on this slide, I want to call attention to the entire line of base insulation products verified as formaldehyde free by UL Environment in 2011. This includes mechanical insulation products we've discussed today, pipe insulation, insulation board, and duct wrap. There are six manufacturing locations in the United States. Two are located in Shelbyville, Indiana, next to our company headquarters, one in Albion, Michigan, one in Inwood, West Virginia, one in Lynette, Alabama, and one on the West Coast in Shasta Lake, California. Our commitment to sustainability continues to revolve around sustainability and ECOS technology. With this commitment, we're able to avoid using more than 100,000 barrels of oil per year, include a minimum of 50% recycled glass in our products, and create a binder chemistry primarily derived from rapidly renewable materials. A number of firsts Knopf Insulation has been able to offer are highlighted in green on this slide. The ones I haven't mentioned already include voluntary ingredient disclosure in 2012 and the world's first environmental product declaration on pipe insulation, which defines the environmental impact of this particular, particular product line. The subject of pipe insulation, I wanted to close with an overview of our product packaging update. The next slide may look familiar to some of you. It simply shows a warehouse in our current pipe insulation packaging and the forms that are available, whether in cartons or poly bags. The following slide is a representation of our pipe insulation labels. They're color coded to allow for easy identification in your warehouse and include the additional detail on a number of pieces per box lineal footage and facings that are involved. The following slide is a close-up of our current pipe insulation packaging. This is in the process of being updated. You may be familiar with this packaging. The labeling itself will not be changing. However, the carton graphics will have a different look as we can see on the next slide. Again, the label's unchanged in spite of the fact this is yellow versus the blue previously, but it still references the facing, the pieces per carton, the lineal feet per carton, along with the color-coded wall thickness. The graphics on the carton were recently updated, and some of you may have noticed that other products in the Knopf insulation portfolio have had updated graphics as well, including our residential and light commercial products and uh, other mechanical products. So the next slide, as we promised, we wanted to take some time for questions. And if you wanna make note of the contact information on this slide, we wanna make sure that if something comes to mind after this presentation, you have the resources and feel free to reach out independently and we'll do our best to uh, answer your questions, provide information and, and just follow up accordingly. So again, I, I thank everyone for your attendance here. I want to turn it back to Jared and uh, you know follow up with any questions that you may have. Thanks, Michael. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, while we are waiting for questions, I do want to take a second to tell everyone about uh, just a reminder about our digital customer platform. Uh, last year, we Distribution International completely overhauled our website, distributioninternational.com. We added a wide range of value-added features including our customer portal called Customer Connect. When you are logged in as a DI customer, you can view past invoices, access your pricing, request quotes, and even submit orders all online. Uh, maybe the best feature is a detailed online product catalog of more than 29,000 products that is easily uh, accessible, easy to search, and easy to navigate. Go to distributioninternational.com today and register for your online account to make your job easier. I uh, also want to remind everyone that to uh, follow Distribution International on LinkedIn and on YouTube and uh, where we post uh, recordings of our past webinars. So great resources there. 
All right, Michael, we have a question from Mark. He says, can you expand on the description of vapor dams between three foot sections of earth wool, 1000 pipe insulation and why it's important? But I think it was directed to me, but I'm gonna defer to Frank. I think that was his area of expertise in this. Yeah, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yep. sir. Oh, okay. I, I think um, what we are concerned with is what um, Daryl alluded to um, in his presentation. There's a concern that at termination points, or let's call it at fitting locations, where there's some fabrication occurring. A lot of times, um, those points are where the vapor will enter because it's frankly, let's just be honest, it's not done properly or completely. So we put a vapor dam at the end of every run where there's a fitting or, or, or fabrication occurs. Uh, that way, the, uh, the fitting will be isolated um, so that when there's a, a condensation issue, it doesn't contaminate the entire run. Um, that's why. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think uh, I don't know of any any material that doesn't recommend that. Uh, we certainly do, uh, as does um, our uh, glass competitors and wool competitors of all types. Um, so yeah, it's it's for isolation purposes. Hopefully, that's uh, that, that's an answer you're looking for. The construction detail on them is one of the questions that I heard. Is uh, with fibrous materials, a vapor dam is constructed with really two products. One is a mastic and two is the fiberglass reinforcing membrane or glass fab as the industry knows it that goes in that mastic. The idea is to run the mastic on the pipe back underneath the insulation material a distance equal to the thickness of the insulation. So if you're using inch and a half thick pipe covering, you run the mastic back underneath the pipe covering an inch and a half. Then you'll butter the end of the pipe insulation completely with vapor barrier mastic or vapor retarder mastic and make sure it is vapor retarder mastic because there's a lot of breather mastics out there that people think just because they resist water, they resist water vapor. They do not. Most water barrier mastics are breathers. But anyway, use a vapor retarder mastic, butter the end of the pipe insulation, uh, either every 12 to 15 feet is a lot of recommendation, 12 to 18 feet is kind of common, but uh, butter the ends of that pipe covering every 12 to 18 feet, run that vapor retarder mastic up over the ASJ plus jacketing, the vapor retarder jacketing on the pipe insulation, again, the same distance as the thickness of the pipe insulation. Embed the glass cloth in that first coat of vapor retarder mastic, run onto the pipe, and then uh, do another coat of vapor retarder mastic to bury that glass fabric. It's construction of the typical uh, fiberglass fibrous vapor dam. Anything else, Jared? That is all the questions that we have. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining, and I certainly want to thank the three of you and, uh, and everybody at Knopf for taking time to do this with us today. Um, be sure to check out uh, our website and YouTube channel in the coming days as we will have a recorded version of this webinar available. Also, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn. We do have more webinars coming up in the next month or so. So if you're following us on LinkedIn, you will not miss those updates. So thank you, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful 4th of July, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your summer. Thanks.